This is the Powered Up Podcast, show number 12. But if you think about the best concerts and the best entertainers, even if there's 30,000 people in that crowd, at some point, every single person in that crowd feels like that singer looked right at them. You know, I mean, that's that's the great performers are the people that can create that kind of feeling. And in our class, and we don't have 30,000 people, right? We got a pretty easy task. But at some point, every kid should know that you you acknowledge them. Welcome to a real world education with insight and advice from teachers in the game, where current and former educators reveal what truly sets apart the great teachers and what it takes to make a positive impact on students. Whether you're in pre-service learning, new to the game, or a seasoned veteran, this is the show for you. You'll leave feeling inspired to take action because we are powering education by empowering you. Host of the Powered Up Podcast, and I am here with my co-host, Mr. Matt. I do not want him driving my kids on a bus, Rogers. Matt, <laughs> how, you, how you doing tonight? I am doing great. Uh, never have I considered having to drive the bus. I've ridden home with kids on the bus, but never driven. How are you, Ken? I'm doing really well. So. Our listeners will find out why we are talking about you driving a bus later in tonight's show. So to to kick things off on that note, um, I normally ask you a pretty thought provoking question, but I'll I'll keep it simple here tonight. Favorite field trip memory you have as a teacher with your kids? Oh man. So I I have to say, we had one um, in, in the Philadelphia area. The Franklin Institute is an awesome science experiential center um, that has all sorts of exhibits. I love that one. Um, but I will tell you, the one that I love the absolute most is we went to our local nat- natural preserve. And the kids went and saw demonstrations about adaptations and um, the like the effects of pollution on an environment and what makes a predator and prey and watching the kids learn so many skills about appreciating nature and what was around them was the coolest thing that we were able to do year in and year out. And not only did it connect with the curriculum, but I felt like it actually made a difference of they would go to a park and see an animal and tell me about, oh, I saw that one hunting this, or the facial structure was set up in a way that you could tell it was a prey because the eyes were on the side. Um, Like these type things, really, really cool about... um, actually having impact beyond just the curriculum now did you guys have in your experience did you get to have field trips because unfortunately you're kind of phasing out of education a little bit i know it's it uh it makes me upset to to know that i that was one of my favorite parts of being a classroom teacher um and so last year i was a special teacher i was the STEM special. So I wouldn't have had a field trip, uh, but there weren't really any anyway. And then this year being an instructional coach, I obviously wouldn't as well. So it's almost like I haven't missed out on it, you know, as a classroom teacher, because they're, they're shut down right now. Um, But we, in fifth grade, we would always take the kids to Gettysburg for a full day. And it was like a 13 hour day, long bus ride. uh, And we had um, local enthusiasts that would come with us. They, there was three buses and three of these gentlemen that love Gettysburg. And they would actually give us like a private tour the whole day. It was not set up through the Parks Association. We just went and got a bus permit. And it was it was incredible what they provided to our kids. But besides the, the content that the kids learned, which was just incredibly profound, my favorite memories or my favorite part was the bus ride and just the, the downtime during the day. And I would always challenge myself to make sure I sat with or did something with every one of my students. And we typically went on this field trip late May. So, you know, we're, we're down to like 
the last 20 days of school by the time this this field trip rolled around. And it was almost like that culmination for me to know that I had connected with every one of my kids to have some sort of personal interaction with them that day that I knew that I could sit down and watch a movie with them or I could, you know, steal their snack or play a video game with them or, or do whatever. And I always loved that part. And one of the most uh, impactful things that I ever had a student say to me, and this would kind of be like my answer to, you know, what's the best advice you've ever gotten in our, our exit ticket is it was actually two students, uh, siblings that I had a couple years apart. And their mom told me that they both said to that, to her about me, that Mr. Ehrman is the te- is one of the only teachers they've ever had that clearly does not have a single favorite student. And, and that, that kind of ties into what I was saying about what I loved about that field trip was I loved having some sort of connection to every student. Some happen day one, some take a long time because they're shy, they're intimidated, they, maybe it's their first time having a, a male teacher who's pretty you know, different in the way they, the classroom operates, um, but that, that's so important to me and it's always been a common piece of advice that we hear from our guests and Lee... I didn't even make this connection when when I started telling this this story. Our guest tonight, Lee Carlson. Wow. I mean, just I have never met a more dedicated person in my life, I don't think. And he epitomizes and knocks out of the park what I just said about making those connections with students. Uh, Matt, do you want to want to jump in about about Lee before we transition into the interview with him? I mean, realistically, we're going to talk about growth mindset a bunch. And I know it's a Carol Dweck uh, kind of coined it or, or named it, but it's, it's a huge talking point in education of really coming to those roadblocks in, in education, those can'ts, how do we switch them to can's, or how can we um, use those as frameworks of how we're going to adjust. And I mean, the things that you are going to hear <laughs> from Lee just represent the fact that he will do whatever it takes to make a child's experience as special as possible. And uh, we open with, he this year is driving a physical bus to make sure his kids get to school. He is learning, he loves sports and activities, but he's run theater performances, he's coached teams, he's run clubs, he's done you name it because the kids deserve it and it's one of those things that you you sit back and you're like i don't i don't know about you ken i'm like i don't cover recess i don't cover lunch i'm not driving buses i just have to to teach at the end of the day am i doing enough it's incredible what he views his responsibility as so that he can do what he loves so much um it's just incredible really really cool stuff Absolutely. He, uh, he really gives us a lot to think about, a lot to be inspired by, and and a really powerful message for a teacher regardless of where you, where you are in your career. So uh, without any further delay, let's jump into that interview with Lee Carlson. Hi, Lee. Welcome to the podcast. How are you tonight? Doing great, Ken. Thanks for having me. Appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. We're, we're really excited to, to get into some deep topics with you and a nice conversation um, so why don't we just kick things off, introduce yourself, where you're from, um, what you teach, and just kind of a, a big picture snapshot of, of what your career in education has looked like thus far. All right, sounds great. I grew up in a, a town of 400 in uh, northeastern South Dakota, um, so everybody knew everybody, um, and everybody knew everything else, uh, but I had teachers that really cared about me and uh, were like family. Um, went to college at Concordia and Moorhead, and uh, my end of my junior year the advisor said I haven't convinced you to be a teacher yet and I said I don't remember you talking about it but I was able to make a switch I already had my English major and was able to get education too Um, so I was 21 years old uh, teaching high school English in Oslo Minnesota up by Grand Forks and I was the head football coach as well so it was kind of a lot of stuff uh, uh, coming at once for a 21 year old uh, when uh, you didn't have the internet or any of that stuff either Um, I didn't have uh, teachers additions either for uh, my classes. So there was a lot of uh, kind of working with the kids and trying to come up with some good activities. Uh, so uh, a couple years there, kind of low guy in the totem pole 
for seniority. Uh, so a couple years, and I was gone uh, back to South Dakota for a year uh, in my hometown of Rossholt, South Dakota. A couple, uh, one year there, then a couple years in Sabika, Minnesota, uh, and then I uh, got engaged. Uh, and uh, again, low guy in seniority, so I sub for a year. Got a job in Sartell, Minnesota, for a year, uh, and then I taught four years in Kimball, Minnesota. Was 19 years in St. James, Minnesota, and now this is my third year in Wyndham. Uh, high school area high school and so I teach high school English uh, but that's also included seventh grade um, I did a couple years working under a grant in the elementary school so I was teaching kindergarten computer skills uh, along with that so uh, I also teach the concurrent classes through Southwest State University in Marshall Minnesota so I've taught uh, kindergarten up through college I guess you could say and uh, coached six different sports and uh, did the advising for uh, the Sad chapter in NHS and uh, did the plays and newspaper and yearbook. So uh, smaller schools, you get a chance to help out wherever you can and then a lot of great, great opportunities. So if, it, if the listeners can't tell, the reason we brought Lee on is he has very little experience and we want to tap into <laughs> what a young rookie educator with um, one isolated experience is like. That's, a, that's quite the journey, Lee. And I'm going to throw a tough question at, at you as, as we kick things off here. If you had to come up with one common thread or one common theme of something you learned through all of those different experiences, different areas, different positions, we're talking K-12, what would you say is just a common theme that kind of defines maybe what you learned or, or what you found to be most important, you know, throughout those experiences? I think uh, we actually just talked about this today with my college English class, um, we're kind of trying to to define the goals a little better. I think I, I had a different kind of idea in mind than, than some of them. So you got to kind of stop and review once in a while. And I'm a coach too, right? So trying to incorporate some of that. But I think uh, just the idea that I don't I don't give anything to my students. Um, I just try and help them see what they've already got uh, and how they can use that. And sometimes there's a lot of support that goes into getting them to take those steps and figure out the right strategies. Uh, I like to say with my coaching too, uh, hey, great effort there. We just got to put it in the right place. So sometimes it's coming up with a better technique or strategy for a kid uh, who's got, again, got what they need. They just don't know how to properly use it yet or effectively use it. So I think that's maybe a common thread that I would say is is getting those kids to believe that um, I'm not going to be there the whole time. But if we can work together and they realize that they've got that within them, um, they're going to be fine wherever they head, head, head next. If that's a college campus or a job or career or the military, whatever, they uh, should be confident wherever they show up. So Lee, I think one of the things that hearing about your introduction and even these common themes is you are pulled in many different directions. You have many responsibilities. Um, and that is the nature of the size of your school. Can you talk about a little bit your school climate? Um, it's incredible that you still manage what I assume to be a small school district to have a relatively traditional high school experience with all the features that you would expect. Uh, just a few people are in charge of doing that. Uh, tell me about like your school staff and what it looks like and how many students. So I, I came to Wyndham three years ago. Um, I was 50 years old uh, and started all over, right? Uh, it was all new technology and new faces and new names. There was a few people that I knew but it was uh, it was a big adjustment. But I also also felt that it was a good move in the sense that I, I trusted the administration. Uh, and I think anywhere anywhere you're at, big or small school, when you know you can trust your administration, uh, and that doesn't mean they're cutting me favors all over the place. It just means I I knew where they stood and I knew I could get answers and and be able to do my job effectively. Um, that's kind of what spurred the move. But uh, when I think about the size of the school, so we have about about 90 kids in a grade, probably. Um, so we're not like tiny, um, yeah, at least by, absolutely. I, I, at least by my, uh, my standards, uh, I realize our schools are a lot bigger, but I think we, uh, provide enough opportunities where if, if there's something a kid wants to try, they, they've got that opportunity and others, you know, larger schools might have more opportunities, but you also are limited with your ability to become part of that opportunity, I think. Um, so I think, uh, when I look at, at the size of our school, I, I've been on some different state boards, and I, th I always talk about smaller schools as uh, people versus programs. So we don't have a director of you know, extracurricular activities or a director of um, you know, um, second deputy 
assistant principal or something like that. But we got people that there's something needs to be done. Somebody will do it, you know, and they may not get official. They might even get paid for it. Right. They might not have an official title or certificate that goes along with that. But if it needs to be done and it's important to a kid uh, and their opportunities, somebody's going to step in and do that. And after you do it for a while, you, you probably get good at it, which also serves as a model for those kids. Right. So I think uh, um, along with that, as an educator doing that, you also understand that these kids have a lot of stuff going on and those extra things are important too. And since you get to know the kids uh, on a very personal basis, you can tie that stuff in and you know it gives that, that whole cooperative feeling to that and that's really pushed by our, our administration. This year with COVID, you know, I'm, I'm driving a bus, right? Um, there's another guy that, that's walking around with a pail and, and rag helping the janitors out. Um, you know, there's, there's people that have to get extra licensure um, because we needed to have more more rooms to spread the kids out. I mean, there's a lot of people that really stepped up, and that that was from the beginning, and it was a clear message from our administration. And we, you know, uh, with our sports, I'm coaching junior high, and they were going to hire another one. Well, then we weren't having a varsity season according to our state high school league, so they left that other position open, and we we're going to rotate varsity coaches down to come and work with the kids like a week at a time, which would be awesome for junior high kids, right? And all of a sudden, here comes state high school league on Friday saying we're going to start the varsity season Monday. So now the varsity staff has to go full speed to get those kids ready, and we don't have a coach. So superintendent says, no, we got a coach. I said, well, who is it? We haven't heard. He says, we got a coach, and it was the superintendent. So he came out and coached junior high football with me, right? And uh, and he knew what he was doing. Um, I actually coached against him when he was in high school. So um, it was kind of fun to get to, to work together. But that's just a great example of – you know, nobody's better than anybody else. Um, and again, if there's a job that needs to be done, somebody has to fill it. And the best uh, best person up is the one that's going to do it. So, and we support that. People understand. You may not be super trained in that particular thing, but you're trying, and people are going to support you too. And I think that actually conveys a really great message. So, I just for comparison, I teach in all. Uh, I'm in the elementary ranks, but um, our graduating classes in the mid to low hundreds. So it's not that much larger, um, and it is very much one of those things. I love your people over programs. We do not offer every single program that my high school of five to 600 graduates offered. But what we did offer was the opportunity for kids to do many things at a pretty high level. Um, and I think about that, like kids going into college and going to this massive college. Well, you, you're going to have one hobby that you can be decently ranked in, or you can go to a smaller school and have many expertises or be counted on to have a diverse background. And I think that's a really great benefit of the small school. Now, mind you, if you can be top of your class in anything in a big school, that means you're pretty good at what you're doing by all means. Um, but really cool to hear your perspective of, you know, if there's an interest, if there's a, a kid wanting something or, or showing interest in something, someone steps up. I have to revisit the statement of you driving a bus. I know you mentioned to it before we really started recording, but you're making accommodations and, and kind of jumping on board at uh, probably pretty limited notice because the conditions required it. And it's a, a team effort. Education's always been a collaborative team effort, but that's quite a, a unique way to be pulled differently this year. Can you kind of speak to that a little bit? Well, I I, uh, I mentioned too. We talked earlier. I grew up on a farm, so you know I'm I'm comfortable with operating machinery. But uh, I hadn't driven a bus for for a while. When I first started in 1988, uh, as a coach, you had to have a bus driver's license. But that was just a couple years, so I hadn't done it for 30 years. But you know there was a need, uh, and it was clear that there was a need. So uh, and the bus company. It's separate from the school, but they really work together well with the school. So there was a lot of support there. And, you know, I, I know I'm appreciated and valued uh, in our in the community of Wyndham. The the city works really well with the school. The hospital works with the school. I mean, it's just a really when we uh, before COVID, when it was homecoming, we the whole gym, every single kid in the whole school district was in the gym and they all know the school song. And it's just it's just this massive noise of people that are sharing their school spirit. And it's authentic. Right. Um, and it's, it's pretty awesome to see. So I think that helps a lot when kids get that re reaffirmation from going from one place to the next and going to the community and coming to school that they're hearing that same message that we take pride in that community and take pride in the school and, and vice versa. So with the bus, um, 
you know, I, when I'm driving the bus, there's kids that, that know I'm driving the bus and there's senior boys driving by on the way to school as I'm heading out and they're waving like this, right? I mean, what senior boy is waving like that to the bus driver, right? But they, I have them in class and they know, they know that's me in the bus. Um, and I tell you, you, you haven't lived unless you're driving a bus through a blizzard and you got a whole bunch of little kids sing along to uh, Super Freak by J uh, Rick James on the radio. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's quite an experience too. So it's, it, it, just speaks to to who you are as an educator and your community at large the way everybody is is stepping up uh, um, what is a way and this is it's kind of a strange question but it just kind of popped into my head what is a way that you can relate this mentality of I'm gonna do everything I can for the students down to the lessons happening in your classroom because obviously if you are this way you're doing all of this for kids I know this is happening day in and day out. So when circumstances weren't so tough, when you were, for lack of a better term, just doing your regular job, what is what are ways that this type of attitude and, and do everything for students comes out in the way you operate your classroom? Well, I think uh, I think word gets around. You know, I, th I think kids talk and they uh, they know um, kind of what to expect. And you, then you have to show them. Right. I mean, if they hear something and show up and you're you're not being being that way um, in their class, then then they're going to have a hard time uh, giving credibility to that. But, you know, I uh, when you're in a smaller school, too, you also get to know the families. Right. So, you know, one one sibling tells another sibling or tells their cousin, um, you know, that's that's another way that things happen. I think uh, when I talk about trying to help in any way I can being in a small school, I mean, we, we have I'm. It's called the circle. So the outer ring of classrooms in the circle, circular building don't have walls and doors. We just have curtains. So with COVID, you got to keep the door open in the room right across the hall from me, the Spanish room, and she is full of energy, all right? So I'm here in that class the whole time I'm trying to do my class. And for an old guy like me, that was really hard to get used to at first, but I could also start making connections, right? And, and, and it was pretty awesome when you can do that in live time, not say, hey, I heard about, you know, you we're all here at the same time. And I'm saying, guys, that connects with, you know, and find a way to do that. So in a smaller school, I think it's easier to keep a little pulse on what's going on in those different classes um, and find ways to connect that and get kids to see that it really is about learning. It's not about show up here for a while, do the dance, go to another room, do the dance. Um, they're finding ways to make those connections and that enriches in every way, I think. Now, I think the, the one thing that I, I want to, kind of press you on is by being pulled in so many directions, right? It can easily distract you from focusing on what's most important, which is your classwork and what you're doing in the classroom. Um, and you obviously do an incredible job of prioritizing that too. Like it, it seems like you take everything and you do everything at such a high level. How do you manage prioritizing um, your school lessons and, and you obviously have great connections with kids. So I assume that you giving so much of your heart and so much of your effort to your school creates an instant respect that you, even in a new school district in a short amount of time, probably don't have to deal a ton with behaviors. But what is that like beginning of the school year like that you're setting expectations? Because at the end of the day, your main responsibility is what you are teaching these kids, which is what you're most trained to do. Well, we got support once again from our administration. We switched to a, a block schedule. Okay? And so I, I have an hour and a half. I have four blocks during the day. So I have an hour and a half with these kids. So we don't need to like launch into this lesson plan 100 miles an hour as soon as they step in the door. We can talk about things. I can listen to them, right? And during this COVID time, bringing kids back from that isolation, I mean, that was super important. And, and so I had the opportunity to do that. And we all know from, from working, you know, if you can, uh, if you can take a break um, when you need to and then be able to hit it hard, um, you're going to get a lot more done than if you just keep trudging along until you're worn out and trying to, trying to crawl along. So I think there's some merit to the idea of the way we structured our, our school this year uh, schedule that helps reinforce uh, what I'm trying to do in the classroom. Um, the other thing is, again, that, that, that collaboration. I really focus on the first couple weeks for sure, and it's been harder this year with COVID, doing mixer things and forcing these kids to face each other and really driving home the message that you guys are going to learn more from each other 
than just some old guy standing at the front of the room. Um, that if we're all are willing to share and respect and uh, you know learn from each other and teach each other, that's going to be great. Last week uh, had a great cultural lesson, and you know taking a so there's 90 minute class, right? So about halfway through, I usually take a little break. And there was a young lady sitting in front, and she's uh, she's uh, Hispanic. And so I, I, it was connected to something we did with with the the story we we're studying. And I just say, you know, I lived in a community where um, it was you know 50 percent Latino in our, in our uh, school system, and I never saw an obituary for a Latino person. And she started nodding her head. And I'm like, well, why is that? I always wondered that for 20 years. I'd wondered that, right? And she said she explained her parents uh, came from Guatemala. Uh, and she knows that if her father was to die, she would have to make sure his body gets brought back, that there's just a small wake here in the States, in the community, but the big wake is going to be back where he gets buried. And that's why they don't, you don't see an obituary. And I said, would you be willing to share that with the class? And so right now with the COVID, I have two classrooms back to back. And so the other classroom, there's a Google meet so they can see me. And then I have a speaker and I got a speaker with a microphone cord because there was too much feedback trying to do it over the Google meet. So I just hand her the microphone and say, at first I say, hey, guys, we got a great lesson here. And, and Isabel's going to share this with us. Um, and it'd be great if you listen. You can learn something. I just learned something I said and handed it to her. And she was just awesome. Just knocked it out of the park. And all these kids were like, yeah, I mean, we all learned something that day. And she got to show everybody, you know, something about her culture. And then I had them stop and think, you know. So that's what you're saying while well, her parent came from Guatemala. But the other thing is she's in 10th grade. And she, how many of you have thought about what you're going to do with your parents' bodies when they're dead? And they'll kind of like this. I'm like, no, I'm just saying that for her, that's part of her life. That's a responsibility she's got right now. And that's just, just part of her culture. And so there was kind of different levels that we were able to look at there. So, um, you know, with that time, I know I have the freedom to do that. If I was under some crush, uh, you know, a, a prescriptive curriculum uh, and an administration that was worried about dotting all those I's like that instead of letting me teach, and make sure there was the most learning going on as possible. It'd be a lot harder to do something like that. What other what what other advantages do you see specifically with the block schedule? I'm a I'm a product of block schedule in terms of where I went to high school, and I'm a huge huge fan of the model. I thought it was incredibly impactful um, to me. I thought that learning was easier in the sense that you had less classes, you had more time there. Um, and I even found when I got to college and we were selecting courses, I thought it was easy. I, I didn't realize that I had been trained for four years in my, my high school to select classes because you had to do that, you know, to navigate the, the block schedule over the course of four years while my, my friends were struggling with selecting their courses in college because they didn't come from that environment. So what other advantages do you see with teaching and for your students learning in a, in a block schedule format? Well, the big, biggest obstacle for learning is always going to be threats, right? So if you have the threat that you just left, let's, I mean, we went from an eight period day okay, to, to uh, four blocks in a day. So you basically just cut down the interactions in the hallway, right? That can sometimes be difficult. You just cut down feeling like I gotta, I gotta try and get everything, you know, covered up here and, and close it up and then rush to this next class. Oh, what do I got to have for this class? I mean, you just, you just cut all that in half for sure. And probably more than that. Um, the other thing too, I think is just the interactions as far as we all know how to play the game. If you got a 40 minute class or 45 minute class, uh, a kid can find a good, some ways to, to stall out the first 10 minutes of not being engaged. Right. And oh, we're, we only bought 20, 10 more minutes and I'm out of here. Well, and there's, they're checking out with 10 minutes. There's half the class that they were able to just basically not be engaged. Well, you, you might try that, you know, in a block schedule, but I'm still going to get you for more than an hour um, of good, solid, connected learning. Um, so, and the other thing kids know, we're, we're going to have to get along. And maybe you don't like me, maybe you don't love my class, but I'm going to try and respect you. And you're going to be open to some learning opportunities and you're going to see other people learning and, and get a chance. I'm going to, I'm going to treat you like a, uh, a, a young adult, if you can follow the rules and uh, be respectful. And so they learn that, I think they learn how to get along with people better in a block schedule too, instead of that, like I said, just kind of stalling out and putting up with a 40 minute uh, stretch of time to get to the next one and do that rat race all day and come back and do it again the next day. Most kids are just, organization is really a tough skill. And so when you got eight classes versus four, um, you really, really gave them a lot better chance to succeed when there's only four things they got to keep track of. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's a great point. I never really thought about those, 
those extra pieces like you were talking about, especially the safety and just the, the limiting transitions. You know, you're, you're transitioning less, you're saving time that way. Um, there definitely are a lot of advantages to that. So you've, you've talked a lot about um, your experience as a coach. Um, so I'm sure that you can draw on some similarities uh, between coaching and, and teaching in the classroom or parallels that you find. So do you want to talk at all about those, those commonalities that you find between coaching and teaching? Well, I think we've all heard that, you know, the, the great coaches are great teachers too. Um, one thing that helped me a lot is uh, I had to quit doing a lot of stuff I was doing in the classroom. I was part of a, an equity uh, project and it actually, it covered five years. So we had some pretty intensive stuff to start out and then we'd meet again every couple months and it was teachers and educators um, from a five state area. It was at the Science Museum in, in St. Paul, Minnesota. And so for an English teacher, it was kind of a STEM thing, but at the root of it, it was an equity thing. So it really caused, caused me to step and think about what am I doing and how does that really impact my kids? What kind of effect is there? And, and am, I, am I putting them at the front of my teaching? So I, I had to quit doing some things I'd done that were pretty comfortable for me. You know, when I was a student teacher, my supervisor said, make sure there's one day every week where the kids work harder than you. Um, I think he had more than one day. But, uh, you know, and, and, and that makes sense. You, you, you got to make sure you're taking care of yourself, too. But um, there still should be some learning, impactful learning that goes along with that. So one thing that they really focused on in that project was the growth mindset theories. So uh, I came back and, and as a coach that uh, took place in the summer and already when fall football started, here I was. Um, we had our first game. Things didn't go so well. I'm coaching the line. And I said, guys, you know, this didn't go well on Friday. I got to figure out a way to coach you better. Instead of saying, you guys didn't do a good job Friday, you're going to need to get, I, here was the coach saying, I need to coach you guys better. So right away, you take this wall where a kid who's working hard, hearing that their effort wasn't good enough, um, you take that wall out of the way, and you get these kids to watch a coach saying, I'm going to figure out a better way. You know, I'm going to be more successful this Friday because I'm, I'm thinking of a better way, and I'm going to work harder at it. And and we're supposed to be a team, right? Why would a coach be pointing at kids and saying, you guys didn't? We're a team, right? So I should be the one modeling that and saying, I need to do better. So in the classroom, I found myself saying, you guys all got this wrong. Nobody's got an answer. You know why? And they look at me and said, because I didn't teach it well enough. Okay, let's look at it again. And you know, and so I think kids really, uh, really appreciate that. And again, takes away that, that whole wall of defensiveness of, Knowing you tried and somebody's telling you you're not doing it right when that person's supposed to be helping you figure it out. I love what you just brought up. And I want to kind of uh, poke you a little more on this. Why do you think, and maybe it's just the lack of experience with coaching, because I think coaching brings out exactly what you just said, but why do you think more teachers don't approach those same situations with that same attitude? Um, and, and this is not knocking any teachers because I've done it myself. And it's just, I think it just is a natural reaction to say, you know, you didn't study enough or you didn't X, Y, Z. What can we do to try to approach these situations with that mindset of, I need to do a better job so that all my students are more prepared or more successful, whatever the, whatever the case is. Well, and I try and tell the students too, you should, anytime I'm trying to teach you something, you should know what you're supposed to do, how you're supposed to do it, and why you're supposed to do it. And if I forget to give any of those to you, you need to check me on it, right? And say, why are we doing this? Or how am I supposed to do this? Or what are we supposed to do? I mean, they should know all that stuff. And I think a lot of times we tell them what they're supposed to do, right? And and if they're really you know committed learners, they should be able to figure it out. Well, if they don't figure it out, then they don't learn, right? And my teaching, I just wasted my time. So to really add value to my efforts and time as a teacher, I also have to think about their learning. But on the same hand, I got to convince them that they're the learners and I'm the teacher. So they can't just sit there and I magically teach them. They also have to be doing the learning. Um, so it's it's a two-way street. Um, you know, if you're 50 years old like I am, it's a lot easier to be comfortable saying, I got to do a better job um, than you're, when you're a first-year teacher and you're you're supposed to know everything, right? And you're, you feel like they're all looking at you and your whole reputation is going to be shot and they're going to be talking about you in the teacher's lounge. I mean, I've learned not to go in the teacher's lounge for very long, right? Um, so I'm just worried about my kids. I'm not worried about, and that's that's going to take care of those other things then, right? Um, you know, you're, you're really, you're responsible for those kids. You're not responsible to the people in the teacher's lounge or uh, the people next door or even the administrators. I get it. You know, they're important. I'm not saying they're not. 
but ultimately I'm responsible those students. So their learning is what's, what's the ultimate goal. So if you take a box and on one side of the box, it says all students can learn. And on the other side of the box, it says not all students are learning, then what's in the box? You know, and that's what, that's what the focus always is, is what's in the box? What else can I find in there between thinking they can all learn and knowing that not all of them are? What else can I do? What else can I find? What else can I bring to this that's going to make that statement on, the, on this side be the same outcome on the other side? That's pretty cool. I've never kind of considered it from that perspective, but that is that responsibility. It's difficult to, uh, I mean, we've all kind of taught towards the middle and got caught in that and, and we've all gotten caught in our ways. And um, I, I think going back into that growth mindset for anyone who's not familiar, I know it's a very common um, term, but it doesn't get, uh, I think people just expect everyone to understand what it means at this point. Um, but the give a little, I'm going to give a little intro and then Lee, if you want to kind of take on your own interpretation. So fixed mindset is really having a kind of st almost stagnant perspective of how you're going to teach or the reflective practices. Like I am teaching this as well as I can, or as a student, I can't do this, this, I can't language, um, and transitioning it to a more perspective, a positive perspective of how you can, how you can use reflection, how you can use criticism, how you can kind of make adjustments to A, look forward to the next opportunity and B, carry it further than you have before. So you want to learn to uh, do a backflip? Well, I can't do that right now. Well, that I can't language is limiting, it stops you, but what are the steps you can take? Stretching and um, jumping and all these different practices and whatever the case may be. So in the classroom, I know that we use that shift in language to recognize less limits and more possibilities. So kind of jump off what I've kind of started and, and take me through your perspective, because I know in the elementary school, there's not as it's very black and white and i'm sure some level at your high school too of i either can't or i can um but that's because in a lot of ways they talk in absolutes so kind of take it away in your perspective well i think one thing that's really important is when we get through our pre-teacher programs and we're going to start teaching we haven't done much teaching okay we've done a lot of learning so teachers are really good at learning they're not always so good at teaching and, and being open to that idea that I'm not very good at teaching and helping this, letting the students help you with that um, and searching out, you know, other it's, it's really easy to just go in your classroom and know what you can do. Right. I mean, teachers sometimes are the worst for the fixed mindset. I know what I can do and I can do this well. Um, and if they want somebody to do a better job, then hire somebody that's got a math emphasis or whatever. I'm just not very good at it. Right. So teachers, sometimes are worse than the kids when it comes to that. But um, we just got to remember that we're, we're not always real skilled at teaching, um, but we're, we can be, we're pretty good at learning. So how do I bridge that? How do I connect that to help me be a better teacher? Uh, and again, searching out professional development, um, listening to the kids. I mean, that's, that's, I've sat at so many meetings where they're like, well, I think the kids would, and I'm like, well, why don't we just go ask them? You know, I mean, why is, why is some 45 year old lady trying to imagine what a kid, a teenage kid thinks, go ask the kid. Um, they'll tell you, right. Um, and boy, we just saved a lot of time and now we can do it effectively and we're probably going to be successful versus thinking that we had it all figured out. And I don't know what those kids did wrong. Well, it was wrong on our end. So trying to go right to the source. Um, if you want to affect a kid, you know, um, pay attention, um, and, and listen to them, um, and give them chances to give you clues by working together. And you can do all this formative assessment, not just on what they're doing, but on what you're you're trying to do as a teacher, you listen to that and you you don't have to say their names, but you come back and say, you know, one thing I'm hearing and here's what I need to clarify or let's back up and look at it again um, in a different way. So I think that's uh, that's one way that as teachers, you know, and it is it's modeling. I look back at my dad uh, who was a farmer and uh, and he, he didn't finish school because um, back in the 50s, that wasn't the biggest priority around, right? And he joined the service, and he's made a, a great life for himself, and he's helped out a ton of people, and I just admire him so much. But when I look back at growing up, that guy was the greatest model of growth mindset you will ever see. I mean, he never cussed. He never complained about stuff. 
he just worked harder and tried to find a new way to make it work or use a new tool to, to break that piece loose that was broken on the combine or, you know, what am I going to do different with my crop rotation this year? Or, you know, what, he's just always you know, driving around on a Sunday, looking at the crops, stopping at uh, Rod's place and talking to him to find out what he did, right? And there's just a constant model of growth mindset that it wasn't even a thing back then. But there I grew up with that great, great example. Um, so trying to do the same for my kids. And again, Sharon, I had a principal one time said, you know, you don't want to share too much about yourself. They can use that against you. Like, well... I, I I checked and I am human, so uh, I'm not going to pretend I'm not, you know, so talking to kids about uh, the summer I was homeless and just drove around in my Harley, right? Um, talking about learning to drive a semi last year when a guy needed help hauling corn, uh, got to do a TED talk. Um, so that's a pretty cool thing to drop on kids. Eh, just look at my TED talk. You got one? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and, and not being pushy about it, but just letting them kind of do their own exploration and checking it out however they want and coming up with their own questions gives them the idea that this guy in this classroom, he did this or he did that. I'm in the same classroom. He came from school smaller than I am. I think I could do whatever I want to. Um, so trying to get that message across to kids. And I, th and I think that that's one of the things and um, th that that's the beauty of the growth mindset is, I mean, you have come across so many tackle uh, tackled so many kind of conditions and situations. And again, the idea of administration telling you, hey, we kind of need a bus driver or we need someone to help the janitor. or We need seven different coaching positions filled. And, and how to, obviously you're not doing all those at the same time, but it's just an incredible perspective to just have that. OK, it, it's a we need to tackle the, the problem at hand. This is what is a need and I have an ability to fix it. It's it's incredible to to be a real human. I think what you nailed is we Ken and I have been lucky enough to have a few guests on every end of the spectrum. Uh, huge advocates, brand new teachers, um, everyone in between, uh, teachers in high technology, low technology, poverty. It's been really neat to see that the, the common thread between it all is we do in education what we need for our kids in our community. And I think everyone's role is so determined by their community. And the biggest fear of new teachers is to expose their community or expose their background. In reality, if you come to terms to the where you live and, and where you teach and all these things and you are honest and authentic as long as you live a, a lifestyle to be proud of, that is something that is an incredible gift and power to level the playing field and it makes the teaching field so much easier. I just think that's a, a huge reflection of just bring yourself. And, and I'm not going to bring in my wife and I both teach in the same school district. There are definitely limits to what I expose, but I talk about my wife all day long in my classroom, all day long, not in detail of what we were making for dinner or the crazy thing that I wouldn't necessarily like want to get into that's not related, but we talk about how we conquer problems and, oh, what her kids were doing. It's just a, there is a balance but it's incredible how you expose yourself and, again, how that allows that community to build in your classroom. Well, and uh, the other part of the growth mindset is to, to be, be realistic about it's not all, well, I just tried something new and it was so awesome. I mean, sometimes we're growth mindset is something we didn't ask for, like a pandemic. Um, a year ago in December, I had a cardiac arrest and I was laying on my driveway on the ice in the dark, dead, right, for a while. Um, is the start of Christmas break. So I actually was back. I didn't miss any school, um, but I broke my leg in a couple places when I fell down. And so when I came back, you know, the kids had heard about it, thanks to social media nowadays, but there was their teacher who had a cardiac arrest and uh, um, broke his leg in a couple places and he's here, right? And they were trying to help me and, and you know, they could see I was struggling to learn how to use a crutch for the first time, uh, crutches. And, uh, you know, it was really helpful for those kids. The hardest teaching environment I ever uh, was in is also the place where I've had the most kids keep in touch with me and and reach out and you know build those relationships so I think um, when when you're trying to when something's difficult and you're not trying to hide it or gloss over it and you show the kids 
that growth model when things are difficult, not just like I tried something new and look at my garden. Um, you know, that, that also sets a really meaningful example. I think that it's hard for them to forget. And if they can be part of supporting you during that, um, that's, that's really meaningful for them too. Absolutely. There's, there's obviously a line, but I, I think teachers draw that line a little too short at times with like you've both said, exposing themselves, their, their personal life, the battles are going through the way that they're learning, you know, that, that growth mindset attitude, I just think is so important to, to really bring to the students and to, and to bring to your classroom, because at the end of the day, as teachers, we're constantly modeling, we're modeling the specific skill, the specific strategy that we, that we want to encompass, but also, you know, the, the way we live our lives. And hopefully, like you said, Matt, it's something to be proud of. And that's something to share. And that's why it's so important for people to get into education that are, or have high integrity and have that desire to be a positive role model. Like you said, Lee, doesn't matter, you know, what your passions are. When you go into teaching, you're not going to have a lot of teaching experience. So you don't have to be a great teacher to go into education. You have to have the desire to be a great role model. And that's, that's really what's most important. Um, I, I love the growth mindset concept. Do you have any lessons or any activities that you do in class that, try to kind of intrinsically build in that growth mindset attitude to the curriculum that you're teaching? Yeah, we, uh, um, last Friday we did peer review in my college credit class. Uh, and so I, I teach, uh, college composition and college literature. And so this year when we had to switch our schedule, I'm actually teaching both during the same block. Um, and that's, I have never done that before. So there's growth right from the beginning and it wasn't something I asked for. Um, the kids understand that and we're working through it together. But the first first round of peer review with this group of kids, it, it really didn't go very well. And, and and so I checked with them afterwards and they said, no, I, I didn't get a lot from that. So I said, well, let's figure out. So this last time around, instead of them sharing it digitally, um, I had them print it out. And, and so we use the six traits of writing model. And for each of those traits, then I had some focus questions and they had a partner and they exchanged their, their copies. And it was a lot easier for them to just write on that piece of paper than to do all the little tricks to do the editing and the comments. Um, they said that was a lot easier. Plus when they exchanged with their next partner, there was, every time that happened, there was some chatter and some laughter, right? That was absent the first time around, which I think opened it up and relaxed people a li little bit to think that I can write some feedback here. We're all in this together. Everybody's gonna be okay. Even if I write something that's you know, not just good job, smiley face. It's going to be, hey, I, I don't understand this. Or you could use better word choice here. Um, Try to give them some kind of sentence frames to help out because they're not experts on, on providing feedback. But there's a dual purpose there of trying to build their analytical skills. When you get to see five different people's essay or five different essays in an hour and think about how you are assessing that, you're also building your skills to be able to look at your own writing and apply those same principles of what good writing is. Plus you get a ton of feedback in a short amount of time. It would take me a heck of a lot longer to give 27 kids that same amount of feedback that they got in just an hour's time, right? But it was a totally different approach than the first time and the kids said it went a lot better this time. So just being open, if something isn't working, don't, don't keep trying to plug away and hope it works better. Just be open to trying something new and it might not have worked this time around. It did, so I'm, I'm glad for that, but the kids saw that I'm, I'm willing to try new things. I'm really incorporate their feedback. Um, and my goal is that they're going to benefit and they could all see that. Well, and again, you're, you're modeling growth mindset. Hey, we're going to try this. Let's see if it works. And if it does, we'll move forward with it. If it doesn't, we'll analyze and readjust. So you're, you're modeling that growth mindset with a lesson that has growth mindset built into it. So it's, it's a great picture of that. So I actually want to uh, kind of stay on this topic of, of lessons and, and transition into our, our next part of the show, um, a look at one of your lessons. So Matt and I are going to ask you six questions back and forth just to try to paint the picture of a specific lesson, project, or unit that you incorporate into your classroom. So the first question is, is it a unit overview or a long-term project or a single lesson? Uh, well, it'd be a, a single lesson connected to a unit uh, based on the, the Mice and Men novel looking at themes very good um what grade level is this usually targeting and uh time of the year that you would teach it uh it'd be 10th graders and we would be we'd be towards the spring 
beginning of springtime. Excellent. So you hit on it a little bit with with um, the first question, but a, a little bit more in depth. What are the objectives of the lesson? So the objectives would be able to analyze theme uh, in a piece of literature. Um, so there would be several choices they would have. I wouldn't expect them to to uh, respond to each one of those, but they would have some flexibility there to pick the ones that they want to, uh, and also finding some evidence, you know, demonstrating their analytical skills and also their ability to find the evidence to back up. And so they could, you know, they could have whatever claim they want. They just need to have evidence to back that up and write effectively enough to where the reader can follow their 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 thought process, um, even if they don't necessarily agree with them, at least to be able to understand and appreciate how they got to that point. So if you were to describe uh, kind of through that lesson, what are the different items that specifically kids are expected to do? What are they accomplishing? How are they interacting? Whether it's collaborative, what have you. Just talk through the perspective or point of view of kids walking through this lesson. Yeah, they, they would it'd be an individual. Uh, it wouldn't be group work. Um, so the first step would be to pick which. which uh, so is it discrimination? Is it isolation? Is it friendship? You know, which, uh, which of these different themes that they want to focus on uh, when they do their writing. And then to go back and think about how could they see that development, um, what would be some evidence that would show different stages of that theme development through the, through the, uh, the novel. And then also how, how do those different themes perhaps intersect uh, at some point through the novel as well. Uh, and along with that would be, you know, uh, picking which characters you're going to focus on to represent that theme with their uh, actions and, and their outcomes. Excellent. So while the students are, are pursuing that and, and developing those ideas, what are your essential uh, uh, pieces and, and role in the lesson for the students to reach success? Well, it would be uh, backing up and, and we've already, we've already covered the writing process and reminding them that there's, there's pre-writing, you know, getting ideas and there's organization then there's going to be some writing. And that's not always a linear thing. Sometimes you're going to have to go back and get some more ideas. In this case, maybe you got to gather some more evidence, or maybe you forgot to see where a theme intersected with another theme, or maybe you change your mind that that's not the character I want to focus on. Uh, I want to focus on a different character. So the writing process is not always linear, and, and your outcome is going to be what I see, but how you get there is going to be kind of what works best for you. So moving around and seeing, you know, if there's a kid looks like they're struggling, just saying, hey, where you at? Um, what are you thinking about right now? What do you got so far? Um, trying to help them as I'm looking at the formative assessment moving around um, and then reminding them of what that, that summative assessment is going to be and how they can get there and giving them a couple different options of how they could do that. Uh, and again, remind them that this is their choice. You're a writer. There's a lot of ways to approach stuff, but uh, you're going to make the choices and here's the, here's the different sets of choices you're going to make. Characters, you know, themes, um, and, and in your writing process. So going along with that growth mindset perspective, um, either or both, you can answer. Um, it, teaching this again, uh, say you do this again in the spring, um, are there things that you would like to change uh, about this lesson to improve it? Or do you have any future goals of extension uh, to kind of blow the lid off uh, the, the top of it and really expand it into something even grander at all? So to clarify, I haven't taught this lesson for a while. Um, this is my third year at, at Wyndham. So the first year, here's like I said, a 50-year-old guy trying to learn all this new technology. I mean, a lot more technology than I had used before uh, for a guy that grew up before this internet thing even existed. Um, and so that first year was just trying to kind of keep my head above water, right? Then last year, we got this pandemic thing that hits uh, along with having a cardiac arrest, right? Uh, and this year has kind of been a whole different kind of deal too. So I'm still not, I mean, I'm, I'm a couple years away from my uh, retirement date if I choose to do so, but I, I haven't even had like a normal year yet uh, where I feel like I've done, done the best that I can. So I'm looking forward to that. But, you know, I did, I did teach that lesson for quite a few years. So that wasn't kind of an easy one to draw back on. If I was to look at it now uh, and how I might change that. So with, uh, with the concurrent classes that I teach, I have a, a master's in education, but I don't have one in English specifically. So the HLC says that you got to have a master's in your subject area by 2023 or you can't teach. And so for our school, a small school like ours, having the, the concurrent classes where you get college credits, taking the class in your high school classroom is really important. 
you think about first generation students, um, and it's, we can talk about college and you know you're going to earn more over your career and all this, but if they don't know anybody that they really care about, uh, you know, in their family, let's say that's done that, that's still a really daunting thing, especially when you look at the price tag. So when they can take a class, a college level course in a building they're familiar with, from an instructor they're familiar with, and find out they can do college level work, and that's that's kind of my part, right, to make sure this is authentic. So they can believe they're going to step on that campus next year and be confident. Uh, and along the way, when they see that, they start to be open to those suggestions or different strategies to try and make it work. That, yeah, here's a sticker price, but you do this and this, and you make an appeal letter, and you do that, and you can get your, you can get your uh, um, tuition down to, to a price that your family can afford, right? Um, so I think that's, uh, that's one thing that's happened, but it also forced me to go back and get 18 grad credits, right? when I'm 50 some years old and I'm at the top of the scale. But if I don't do that, we don't have the program in the school anymore, right? So I need to do that. So the last course that I took was a digital writing seminar. And that forced me to really look at different ways to, to do more with technology with my class. And boom, you know, here we are in the middle of a COVID, um, uh, the pandemic, and there's been a lot more emphasis on using technology. So in a way that was kind of an extra strain, but it also prepared me to, to help my kids a lot more. So if I looked at that assignment that I haven't done for several years, that would be one thing I would incorporate would be some digital writing projects, which really allows kids to be creative, right? Um, there's some components, I, you know, you need to have color somewhere in the slide, you need to have uh, text, you need to have a visual, but there's all kinds of different opportunities and ways you can approach that. So there aren't a lot of assignments sometimes, the kids, we can do creative writing, but you're, you're all read the same novel, right? And you all know you have these different criteria for theme, but with a digital writing project, there's, I mean, there's kids that you don't hear a peep from hardly all year. And you look at what they created and say, Oh, that's, that's really awesome. Can I share this? And now everybody gets to see that that kid over there is really talented. And there's something that they can teach everybody else about how to make that effect in their slide or whatever for the next project. So that's what I would incorporate if I did that lesson again. What a great answer. And uh, you just you just keep modeling more and more the growth mindset. It's it's really incredible, Lee. Um, so we're going to head into our last section of the show called The Exit Ticket. Four questions back and forth between Matt and I that we ask all of our guests. Uh, question number one is, what is the best thing a teacher can do to make a student's school experience better? I, I, I try and uh, make sure they know they have a place in my classroom and that irregardless of what happens with the content, that there's something about them that I value. Um, so that means asking questions, paying attention. Um, you know, when, it, when you say something that a kid didn't know you heard, uh, that it's their birthday or that they're uh, in FFA and they, they won a ribbon at the state fair, if they, if they find out that you knew that and they didn't tell you, then they know that you care about them, right? Um, and again, that's easier in a small school. Um, everything that happens is in the, the newspaper, right? Um, and so uh, I think that's important. You know, I, I have kids make a banner with their name on it, and they get to put that wherever they want in the classroom. That doesn't interfere with my teaching. But when they come in the classroom, they see all these banners, but they also see their name, right? Um, and they get to make that banner how they want. And it's their, you know, it's their writing and whatever they choose, and that's their personal touch that they put in my classroom because it's not just my classroom, right? It's their classroom. Um, and there's banners from other years that are still up there. Um, and so they get to see that they're, they're going to last. I'm not just going to run them through the mill and push them aside and grab another group of kids and put them in my classroom. They're, they're somebody. And this is with my coaching, I guess I tell my players all the time, guys, this season is going to end at some point, but if you do things right, you're always going to be my player, right? Or you're always going to have that teammate. If you do things right and you're the best teammate you can be, you're always going to be that teammate, no matter if the season ends. And so kind of that circle thing, right? Staying in the circle. Um, my students know that I'm, I'm going to care about them. I want to see them again later on. I want to hear those they're successful. And, and if I can support them later on, I want to do that too. That's an awesome, awesome answer. Um, you're obviously incredibly wise. You have so much to share with your kids. I would love to be in your classroom. Um, 
what is the best piece of advice that you've gotten? Um, and it could be from a colleague, could be a supervisor, or even a student um, that you always think of, whether it's a, a challenge comes up and how do you have composure to deal with it, or how do you wake up to bring your full best every day? What is, what is that piece of advice that you're always leaning into? Well, um, there's kind of two parts of that. So one wouldn't be advice. It would be the model I see every day. My wife's a teacher too. And she, she's just awesome. Uh, she's a fifth grade teacher. And I can't imagine anybody caring more about their students than, than she does. This is this pandemic things have been really hard on her because she didn't have them in her classroom all the time. She couldn't hug them all the time. Um, and so that, that's, that's an inspiration to me to see how much she cares about her kids and how hard she works. Right. And, and so there's that part, but then I would go back to my dad. Uh, I was a head basketball coach when I was 24 and he came to watch a game. My dad, uh, he didn't play sports. He didn't, uh, I have three brothers, didn't coach us in anything. Right. Um, we all end up playing college ball. So he just told us, you know, be the hardest worker out there and make sure you're having fun. Uh, I think if more parents followed that, that approach, we'd probably all be a little better off, but he came to the game and I got home and, and he said, you, you yell too much. I said, what? I said, they weren't hustling down. They weren't doing this. And, and he s sat there and listened to me, rolled about all these things that the kids weren't doing. And he said, well, did it change when you yelled at them all game? And it didn't, right? So we played a Christmas tournament three, three nights in a row, going an hour and a half one way to play games. The first game was a triple overtime game. And then this game that night was two hours one way. Um, the kids were just tired, right? It wasn't because they didn't want to hustle. It wasn't because they didn't care. They were just tired. And here's some joker yelling at them in front of this big crowd the whole stinking game. So even if they were trying to be motivated, here's a guy that's supposed to care about them that was just failing them. Um, so it really, really made, that's something that's always stuck with me is in the classroom too. It isn't going to help me to, again, to say, you guys need to do this or that. If it isn't working, what's, what's something I have to do differently? Um, and maybe I just need to shut up for a while or I need to say it a lot quieter or bring it across a lot quieter or in a smaller piece to help those kids be able to find some success and build on that. And sometimes they're just plain tired, you know, um, and I need to respect that and be able to pick up on that and find a way to let them breathe for a little while uh, and find out what we can accomplish today and maybe readjust some of the goals. So That is something that I wish every pre-service college graduate could hear before they leave school or before they start their first day of student teaching or something like that because that was that was that was just such great advice the what your dad said to you is just it's so important and it's it's so easy to do as a teacher it's so easy to get frustrated because it's a really hard job and it's important not to so on that note you know, the school year goes in waves and there are those extremely stressful times, not just for students, but for teachers where we're tired, it's conferences, it's report cards. What is something that every educator needs to hear in that moment to, to power up and to, to rise out of it? Well, I think it, it, that connects a little bit with what I see um, as far as a teaching career. I mean, you, you got, there's highs and there's lows, right? There's rewards, but then there's some frustrations. Um, some years ago in Minnesota, uh, a governor, Polenti, came up with this super teacher idea that you would get paid more for this and doing that and kind of put a dollar amount on all these different things. But it didn't work because there's some things that I don't care how much you pay me. If I can choose not to do that, I'm not going to do that, right? But if you approach teaching as whatever it is that I got to do, I need to do it. Um, instead of dividing it up, it's all part of being a teacher. And for me, there's really no limit to that other than the time we got in a day and the energy I have. If there's anything else I can do, I'm going to try and do it. Um, but I think as a teaching career, we, we have a shortage of teachers right now. I think we also have a shortage of retirees. When I first started, there was all these retirees saying, it's going to be hard. There's going to be moments, but the retirement's worth it. But when half of our teaching force quits within the first five years, you don't really get to that point where you recognize that all those challenges and frustrations, they're, they don't mount up against the rewards. It takes a while to build up those relationships and to be sure about what you're doing and take some pride or to search out those professional development opportunities or to build a collegial relationship where you learn from a mentor. Um, it takes more than five years to get to that point. 
but there's so many people that cash it in before then that they never really find out why you want to make this a career. Um, so when you think about a bad day, I had that first year at Wyndham. I mean, there's we use uh, the platform Schoology. I spent the whole year saying Schoology, right? And there's no other adult in the room. The kids are like, you know, and I'm like, uh, I didn't know how to say it. No, I just saw the word printed, right? Um, so, I mean, what a what a goof. But uh, so when you talk about struggles with something as simple as that, it's going to happen. But I also had some days that were just bad because I wasn't prepared. You know, uh, and or, or something else happened. Maybe it was a managed class management discipline thing. But I, I always came home. And if I wanted to, if you're a teacher and you want to make sure you don't have another bad day like that, you can you can figure out a solution. And I think with educators in our state, there was a lot of uh, restrictions that were put on. There was a lot of, you know, uh, uh, COVID precautions about spacing and wearing masks and all that kind of stuff when we came back. And there's people oh, and, and you hear this. People complaining about how hard it is. Well, as an educator, our job is to figure stuff out, right? So I never saw it as this added burden. It's just something we got to figure out. I mean, ultimately, if I'm going to be a teacher and there's something in the way, I need to figure that out before I can do my job. And that becomes part of my job then. If it meant driving a bus to get kids to school, then that's a pretty important thing I had to figure out, right? Um, if if I had to find a speaker with 100 feet of, of microphone cord so I didn't have feedback in the other room that was annoying kids, um, then I needed to figure that out. And so that's in my classroom now. But uh, just always looking for ways to, to make things better. And if you have a bad day, I mean, anytime I had a bad, and I had a few, um, the next day was always better because that was my goal was to not let that happen again. And I'm the one responsible for that classroom. Absolutely. I just got to jump in before Matt asks his last question on the schoolology topic. Um, I So Matt and I, we teach graduate courses for another company called PD Campus. And going back probably five years now, we, uh, for the one course, I uh, was tasked with making tutorials on how to submit us all the assignments into the LMS, and we use Schoology. I pronounced it Schoology probably a hundred times over the course of those six videos. And um, our director, he, he calls me and says, hey, these screencasts are great, <laughs> but you know it's called Schoology, right? Not Schoology. And you, after you, <clears throat> and I've heard other people make the same mistake. Oh, I've made it myself. I don't, yeah. I don't know what it is about the word. There is not an extra OL, but everybody <laughs> pronounces it that way until someone calls you out. And then you look at it and say, where did I even get that extra OL from? But, um, I digress, Matt, go ahead and ask your, your last question. <laughs> well, I, I would, if I, if I would, uh, before asking that last question, I, I just have to commend what you just said. Because I think that when you talk about the waves in education, the limits and the perspective, again, to, to emphasize growth mindset, I am an 11 to 12 year teacher at this point, and I am coming up against roadblocks in, in all honestly, honesty, my, my tank is running a little bit emptier than I wish it would be. Um, and I'm not dealing with nearly the challenges of, of being tasked to even cover recess duty. Um, but I just, I think talking to you and keeping that little segment in my brain is something that's going to stick with me. And I hope the listeners for a long time that, you know, there are, it's the responsibility of teachers to deal with challenges so that you can prioritize the most important thing, which is instructing kids. But there's so many more layers and it may be interpersonal. It may be what happened at home it may be physically getting there or being hungry all of those are part of the beautiful gift of being a teacher i just want to add one thing quick too i've, I've kind of framed it sometimes as uh, uh like bad karaoke we all know what bad karaoke is right i mean we've we've all experienced that so sometimes our teaching can be like that um but if you think about the best concerts and the best entertainers even if there's 30,000 people in that crowd, at some point, every single person in that crowd feels like that singer looked right at them. You know, I mean, that's that's the great performers are the people that can create that kind of feeling. And in our class, and we don't have 30,000 people, right? We got a pretty easy task. But at some point, every kid should know that you you acknowledge them. When we did distance learning, you know, I always did a, a check in and check out. I mean, those those kids knew that 
if they came to my class, even if they didn't pay attention to the lesson, right, there was going to be somebody that said, hey, how you doing, Matt? Hey, Matt, are you there? And at the end, I'm going to say, oh, I got any questions, Matt? Are you good? Okay, we'll see you tomorrow. Every kid knew that I was going to say their name personally at least twice. And then I also saw that these kids didn't just check out. They waited around, right? Because they got to hear their classmates respond, even though they weren't together in the classroom, that was still a way for them to keep some connections. And so kids are really, really craving that idea that they're connected somehow, whether it's the banner that they see in the wall that they created, whether it's getting to work in a group, whether it's at some point where I looked at them, and even if it's just a wink, right? Like, I, I saw what you were doing there. You know, you're trying to poke your buddy or something. I'm not going to send you to office of that, but I saw you, and now you're not going to try it again. But you also know that I saw that you're a kid, right? Um, you know, there's got to be some point where there's that connection, um, and they, they recognize it. And, again, they know that there's value attached to that. So the last question of this segment really comes down to how do we, we – um, continue to learn from you, um, whether social media, I know you mentioned a TED Talk, what are our ways to continue to, to kind of learn more about your experiences, get in contact with you, um, whether other listeners are uh, in similar situations or just inspired by what they're hearing? Well, um, yeah, I, I got a TED Talk. Um, I got, got picked to do that. You know, if you're teaching – there's a lot of steps to a TED Talk. They want to protect their brand, right? Um, so there was, there was kind of a lot of work going in with uh, while well, I'm trying to be a teacher. So on my way up to the TED Talk was basically when I practiced. Um, and then sitting in the crowd, here's your growth mindset, sitting in the crowd, thought of some other ideas. So the first eight minutes was basically what I thought of sitting in the crowd before I walked up to the stage. Uh, but it went all right. So, you know, that's pretty easy. Lee Carlson TED Talk will get you get you there. Um, I think it was called The Good, Bad, and the, and the uh, TED Talk. Um, but it talked about about 25 years ago, they took out my adrenal glands. Uh, I had a rare disease, and uh, I was making four times the cortisol that you're supposed to have. My blood pressure was like 200 over 160, just sitting still, right? I went five years without sleeping more than two hours at a time. Uh, and I taught and coached through all that. And every every day, I kind of went downhill a little bit. Your body really gets worn out from running at those RPMs. But I also had to think each morning, do I really want to do this, right? And every morning, I had to decide that no matter what the pain was, I, me going to teach was worth it. And, you know, after you do that for five years, uh, every day, you, you get pretty, you get pretty firm with your belief about the value of teaching. And in a way, I think it, it kept me alive till I found a doctor that could diagnose it. Right. But their advice was stay away from stress, uh, while I just teach and coach. So it shouldn't be a problem. Right. But for me, actually not doing something would be more stressful. Uh, and I had to figure out, you know, what's good stress, what's bad stress. Uh, and so if you look at the TED Talk, that's what that'll be about. But I think it was a really, really, uh, I wouldn't recommend the process, but it was really helpful for me as a, an educator um, to really think about what's really important in my classroom. Um, and ultimately, it was, it was the students um, that was what was important. Um, so the TED Talk, yeah, um, I'm, on, I'm on Facebook. I got, got Twitter, I guess. I'm not super into the social media, but um, I've also been part of some opportunities where it helped to uh, help to have a platform where people could contact me. But, uh, you know, if you Google Lee Carlson, uh, Wyndham high school, I'm sure you'll get my email that way too. But, uh, yeah, I just looked it up. The, uh, Ted talk is called stress, the good, the bad, and the Ted talk Lee Carlson. Excellent. Thank you. We will, uh, we'll link to everything that you just referenced Lee in our, our show notes page, which can be found at power com slash show 12. Um, so we'll we'll link to that video as as well as some of your other articles that I know you've written and, and your social media handles. And Lee is on is on the platform as well. So if you are not a member already, make sure you become a member at poweredup.com and you'll be able to connect and follow Lee there as well. Um, Lee, thank you so much. This was this was really inspiring. Um, I, I, I needed this now. I know Matt's gonna go in tomorrow uh, real charged up. It goes without saying your kids are incredibly, incredibly lucky and blessed to be in your classroom. And your district is incredibly lucky to have you um, serve so many roles. Um, and, and you clearly value all of them the same because they, they help students. So thanks again. This was this was fantastic. I Thank you to all our listeners. one more shout out. Could I get in? Yes, please. One last one. All right. So there was a kid that sat at our table listening to his mom, the fifth grade teacher, talk about you know this frustration or that and me as a high school English teacher 
um, who's now a, a, an elementary fire teacher, and that's my son, Sam. So when you step back and think about a kid who sat right in the middle of two teachers talking about frustrations, he also heard and saw the rewards, right? Um, so I think you see that more than once where you've got uh, a kind of a family tradition where there's, there's you know, children of teachers that go into teaching. I think it speaks to that. What I was talking about is that they're, they're really, it takes a while to understand that there's, there's rewards that far outweigh all those, those frustrations. Um, and you just got to stick with it. Uh, and he's doing an awesome job. He's, he's a coach right now. He's actually coaching his little brother. So uh, a couple of days we get to go watch them start the playoffs and uh, just, you know, what a, what an awesome opportunity for an old coach like me to see my, my son coaching my other son and them, you know, eight years apart, getting to be on the same team. Um, but again, the, at the heart of that is just seeing what's, what's special about uh, being a teacher. Uh, I don't think there's enough of that in our pre, pre-teaching programs that help kids recognize that and understand it takes a while to get there, but it's so, it's so worth it. Um, so again, I appreciate you guys giving the opportunity. You're doing great stuff here and um, I'm going to, I'm going to keep following Powered Up uh, and uh, Powered that Up and, uh, and all this great stuff you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. That's, that's amazing. And Matt, I think we might have our, our first opportunity for a, um, a father son combination to be on the, on the podcast. So we yeah. have to have your son on. Um, and, and, and let him, let him speak a little bit about, uh, growing up in that. And then also his, his journey, um, early in education and, and coaching so far. So that's, that's incredible. So thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, so this, this was fantastic. I, I'm, I, I'm real jacked up and it's, it's real late at night, but that's okay. Uh, that's how it usually goes here. Thanks again, Lee and, and Matt, why don't you, uh, close with any thoughts and take us on out of here. Yeah. I mean, I think that if anything, this, this episode, um, sets it's the true example of the growth mindset and the power of it right every ta- every hurdle you need to tackle you will find a way through it and the reward in teaching the the reward you think when you get into teaching is really the reward and it really comes down to the investment you put in it and lee you kind of demonstrate that so as we power down this episode i know we leave you powered up uh have a great week get into the classroom make a difference make a connection listen to all these great points um and uh we look forward to hearing from you next time thanks again lee yep thanks guys